Hey guys, it's JT Tran and I am bringing you a very special guest, Heli Lee, author, documentarist, and director of a nonprofit, an all around Asian American Wonder Woman who Fierce. saved her family from North Korea, right? Yes. Yeah. You might Nine recognize her. <laughs> not just one. <laughs> well, you might also recognize her from Oprah. But you also did a really fascinating documentary called Macho Like Me, which I first heard of at Jeff Yang's The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Mm -hmm. And why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your documentary? Um, I'm a, you know, I'm an Asian woman, daughter, um, sister, and being raised in a, you know, 1.5 Korean American family where I was born in Korea, but raised here from a very young age. I was always told that there were limitations for myself because right. I was the middle child, I was the daughter, I was not the son. And things were very different in my household. I realized that there were a lot of favoritisms towards my brother. And that always pissed me off, but there was I felt always powerless to do anything. Right. I mean, that's sort of like in Asian kind right. of society, right. that patriarchy. Absolutely. And it... It always bothered me and it was, you know, always just below the surface. And so when I became an adult, I always thought, you know, what would it be like if I could just be a guy for like one day? I would just love to <laughs> roll around in the privilege and the luxury. Where it's Not like, have to shower. Not, not have to do anything that women have to go through every day to be presentable. Right. And um, so I decided to do it. I just came back from Asia. I helped rescue nine members of my uncle's family from North Korea. That's great. And yet, you know, that achievement and all the other stuff that I thought were pretty cool and pretty amazing that I have done for myself in my life as a career were just really paled in comparison to not being married. Yes. Right? Yes. Asian parents are always like, when you get married, when are my grandkids coming yeah. out? Where's that rock? <laughs> we don't care how big or small it is. Just do you have one? And so I didn't. And I mm. thought, well, since I don't have a husband and all these people are giving me crap about my single status, I really want to see what it's like to be on the other side because I'm sure it's going to be a hell of a lot better than what I'm used to. Right. And so I did it. Little did you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I cut my hair, I changed my clothes, I moved out of West Hollywood, mm. and I moved it to a place where I thought I could completely start over as a guy. And I was only going to do it for about 10 weeks, but when I got to that mark, I realized I was literally just starting to experience what it was like to be a man. Because the transition from a female to a male took a lot a practice right. more than I thought it was going to and then once I started passing my 10 week was coming up so I decided to extend it and so I lived as a man for a total of about six and a half months it was tough <laughs> yeah very humbling but I have to tell you it was um, it was life-changing mm -hmm. had I not done that I don't think I would be who I am and where I am at this point and I love um, the fact that I have sort of gone on this amazing life ch journey and am here today. Right. I mean, I know like some of our audience, especially like Asian guys, we grow up a little bit, some, some of us, not all of us, a little bit resentful on some of the sort of what we might consider privileges that Asian women have, where it's easier for you girls to date and navigate society and there's like less pressure on you girls. Mm -hmm. Because we're the ones, I know you felt pressure to get married, but we're the ones like, okay, you have to marry an Asian woman to pass along our family name yeah. and bring honor to the family. But as more as I started to date women, I realized that your lives are pretty tough. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I never knew that how much kind of like, Physical physicality like until women started telling me that it's kind of dangerous being a girl even t in today's day and age and Until I put myself in a woman's shoes and try to understand her perspective I had a better appreciation right. and that's the same thing you did except you literally did it You lived as a man you you hung out with men you played sports with them, mm -hmm. right? And how did that feel like as a guy? What I think was great about my experience, not only did I just hang out with the same group of people, I hung out with young men in their 20s, their 30s, and my mentor was an 83-year-old man, and that was so eye-opening, that experience of learning about his life journey and where he is now. Um, and I also got to hang out with straight men and gay men, and so I got this 
worldly perspective. The great thing about documentaries is like I plotted things out. I thought I was going to go down this path, but I never envisioned being mentored by an 83 year old man mm. or, or actually being going into the gay community because I really wanted the straight perspective. But going into the gay community really was such an amazing experience and such a loving experience when I needed it. And i um, just happy to have had that. But you know, this is the first time I actually heard where men, you know, felt jealous of, um, Asian men felt jealous of their counterpart. I knew it, I mentally knew it, but I didn't grasp it till yeah. I came out of the experience. I mean, you, you, um, undoubtedly you've heard of like all like uh, the gender dating disparity and the out marriage. Mm. I mean, I know growing up there's like a lot of like angry, bitter Asian guys. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, for a while in college, I was angry too until I got a girlfriend, and I'm like, I'm no longer angry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a little yeah, little exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of, mm -hmm, um, obviously. Our, our Asian guys are wondering about dating, and you have a story about going to the Playboy Mansion. That was right. awesome. Like, yeah. I would have gone straight gay or female <laughs> or male, but it was it was an interesting perspective. It was also kind of lonely and sad to watch yeah. the dating scene and watching it from the female and the male perspective. You were like Jane oh, Goodall yeah. and the Gorillas of the Mist watching them try to, <laughs> in their natural habit to try to yeah. mate. But you know, I also realized just how powerful women are in the whole dating scene. You know, we get to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And you you pass the boundary that we set up for you, we can call 911, right? Yep. Yep. And, um, but for men, there are a lot of rules to dating. There's a lot of embarrassment. There's a lot of insecurity. And there's a lot of competition with um, with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing that perspective, it was a huge eye-opener for me. Yeah. And I thought, wow, it's so much better being on this side. <laughs> yes or no. Well, what I found fascinating was how you were saying, as a guy, our standards are pretty simple. There's physical attraction and whatever kind of personality Maybe traits you that you have. Maybe you guys have five things you're looking for. <laughs> pretty much. That's it. Like, we have like a hundred. Yeah. Right? And you were talking about like you didn't realize it as as the more you gain value as a woman mm -hmm. in both like who you are, your beauty, but also your career and where you're going in life, you start adding to this list and it keeps growing. Right. It has to be a leader, but you can't be you know too bossy. He has to be you know, um, kind, but he can't be wishy-washy. Like, it's kind of this yeah. sort of internal double standard, and your list keeps growing. But Ur, as no a guy... Men are so angry and so confused, no. you know, and why relationships don't work out. It's interesting because what I learned about relationships and how to be a better woman and how to be a better man, it's <laughs> when I did Macho Like Me a couple of years ago, um, therapists used to send their troubled married couples to come and see my show, ah. and that was that was pretty incredible. Well, the thing is, I saw your show, and I you know posted on on my social media, and I had like some of my students actually went to your show. Oh, that's great! Thank you. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I was meeting with a student and his fiance, and he had told his fiance about me, and she wanted to meet me because I was going to be in the wedding and everything like that. And I just like mentioned your documentary and your show because she was trying, she was really trying to understand like why this confident guy that she was now marrying even needed my help mm -hmm. in the first place mm -hmm. because she only met like the final product, <laughs> not who he was and his insecurity. Um, so I was like, yeah, you have to watch Helene's documentary because I found it fascinating. And it's, I think it's fair and it's pretty balanced, you I know? I think so. It absolutely is. Um, did you run into any kind of like sexual discrimination as an Asian guy? No, I ran into discrimination as a gay man. Ah. You know, I did not, when I first made the transition into being a man, I didn't go right into being, a, you know, crossing as a man. I went from, you know, heli to people thinking that I was a lesbian, a soft mm -hmm. lesbian, <laughs> then a hardcore lesbian, and then gender non-specific, right. and then to a gay, young Asian male to just becoming a male. So right. it was a long, long journey. But um, the sexual discrimination was not being a female, but it was being a gay male that I experienced right. amongst straight men. And that was, that was very intimidating. 
Yeah, I think that was at a, a, a Latin wedding, you're mm -hmm. saying? With that but kind of like... Just, oh. yeah, even at the Latin wedding that I was... Um, they were judging me, not because of what I looked like, because I was passing as a man, but because of my certain mannerisms, I was too emotional or too touchy or <laughs> too this or that. And they just decided I was gay, right. right? Or I was a fag, quote unquote. And I heard people say, or, or queer, you know? Yeah. And not in a positive way, obviously. And so um, that really made me aware of how I needed to behave so that I wouldn't, didn't get the shit didn't beaten out of me, right? right? Well, the interesting thing is, you, you remember there's that kind of big brew of uh, that magazine with the Asian, with uh, the subtitle, is he gay or is he Asian? Oh. It was in Details Magazine, you remember that? No, I, I can't believe I missed that. Uh, this so was, guess. you know, several years ago. But but here's the thing, and this is something I encounter is where you, you might not think it was like racialized sexual discrimination, but for us Asian guys, that effeminate to asexual boundary is a lot like larger. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if you're like a tall white guy or a black guy, you know, you're automatically sort of assumed like heterosexual. Mm -hmm. But if you're a short Asian guy, that those boundaries are a lot softer. So I will get called, even yeah. though I'll, I'll be with a girl, we'll be like holding hands and kissing or something like that. Like I will hear like mutterings like, oh, this guy's gay or something like that. And it's because I'm a short Asian guy. Mm -hmm. Or when we're out with my students, people was like, oh, it's Lloyd, you know, from oh, yeah, an entourage. Yeah, yeah. There's this more of this automatic assumption that a, a smaller, or more thinner Asian guys, more well, feminine. But there's always going to be those ugly things mm -hmm. out there. But we as individuals and community and, you know, just humanity, mm -hmm. how we how we are and how we present ourselves um, will have an impact. So right. I'm not worried about that. Well, you have, for the audience that don't know, you're, you're a mother and you actually have twins, yeah. a boy and a girl. I thought, what is this boy doing here? I'm not prepared. But the fact that I did macho like me, in fact, has prepared me to be his mom. Mm -hmm. Because I know somewhat what he's going to be facing, the challenges of becoming a man is going to require him right. to be and what people are going to expect and like pummel him with, you know, right. expectations and demands. And so hopefully I could cushion that for him and prepare him emotionally for the things that are not going to be emotional right. for him. Well, what was, I thought was fascinating is how you're talking about with your daughter, there is sort of, from at least from a societal level. That's uh, a go girl. Yeah, fair. there's a more of a support Kick system. some ass. Mm. Be as feminine and tough as you want to be. And then to my boy, they're like, mm. Why are you crying? Why are you wearing your girl, your sister's little tutu? There's all, and he's only six. Yeah, it's like walk it off. And so now he knows tutus and pink are off mm -hmm. limits to him. And I want him to know that that's not off limits. He could be as creative and individualistic as he wishes, and as emotional as he wishes. Um, but then I think to myself, am I preparing him for the real world that's gonna kind of no. pummel him if he cries too much? Yeah, well the thing is like when, when I have these students, I swear I describe them as, and no offense to my students, like boys in men's bodies, mm. right? Because you know a lot of them are in this immigrant uh, family growing up mm -hmm. and it's, you know, you gotta be an engineer, you gotta be a doctor or a dentist or something like that just to, you know, survive and be successful in the family. And they're not socially prepared to, to navigate, you know, society and culture and right. to, to talk to people. And they come to the program and it's like they they know how to communicate. But it's 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 really difficult bridging that gap when you're used to being like sort of an isolated Asian family and trying to integrate yourself into That's society so as a whole. Amazing. Like your, your students, mm -hmm. they're what, how old are they? They're, tw you know, 20s and 30s. Well, when I was 20s and 30s, <laughs> and I'm not telling you which decade that was in, but things haven't changed mm -hmm. since when I was growing up. And you guys are experiencing the same problems and the challenges that I did um, growing up. So what do we do about it? You know, what you can do, first I always say, is you really have to respect the people who brought you into this world and who mm -hmm. brought you into this country Absolutely. To, to make a better living 
for yourself. So that they, they took a sense. massive risk coming yeah, here. Absolutely. Like my family came in from Vietnam, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a kid, you're kind of resentful, like all the weird stuff your Asian parents do, and they give you the Asian food that like all your friends make fun of. But as I was older, I was like, I realized like they took a massive risk. So like I totally appreciate mm -hmm. definitely respect, you know, your parents. But then you come to this country and you get the ed best education in the world mm -hmm. and you get opportunities that you get in nowhere in the world. And I've traveled so many places and I know by far, for me, this is probably one of the best countries in the world yep. for opportunities. Absolutely. And you have the ability to change your own destiny, to plan it out your future. Um, but you also have to be courageous about that and you have to be smart about that. That means getting your education. That means taking risks, mm -hmm. um, crying a little if you need to, pick yourself up. And Getting outside that yeah. box, even if it's, you know, not this, you know, the box that your Asian parents want you to be in. But you have to understand why they want you to be a doctor and lawyer, because that's security. Um, that's respect. That's all they know. But there's other ways to make a name for yourself in this country. You just have to be smart enough to seek it out and then to go after it full force. Um, the great thing about it is, is if you fail, you will never fall too, too low if you have family and friends to pick you up. So you can be as fearless as you want and jump off that bridge because there's going to be a little bit of cushion to support you um, where a lot of people don't have family and friends. Right. So if you have that, go for it. Yeah, it's sort of like the stereotype, you know, that you almost see no homeless Asian people, which is not like absolutely but true. Do, but <laughs> I'm always so shocked. Like, where's your family? Where, where are they? Where's your friends? Who's not taking care of you? Who's not, you know, um, calling you on your shit, right? <laughs> um, so before we close out, Hallie, do you have any last minute words of wisdom of our Asian audience? And who are struggling to find that that Asian like male identity and a society that kind of like oppresses, if I might use that word, uh, on us as Asian guys with stereotypes or, or gender identity. I just think though, it may look better on the other side <laughs> of the fence, but it's not necessarily true. So what you have, you have to make the most out of, and it's amazing what you can make out of what you have even if it's very little. And I started off with so little in my life, my family did too, and we've really expanded by sticking together, educating ourselves, and being fearless on the choices that we make. Um, and I do hope that you guys come and see Macho Like Me because it has humbled me, it's changed my life, it's made me grow as a person, as a spirit. And it was fun for just a little while to see what it's like to be a But guy. you wouldn't want to be a man. <laughs> Not forever, because this is the body that I've been given. Right. And I'm very happy with and very fortunate. Yeah. Well, I, I saw your show, uh, Macho Like Me, and not only did I, uh, you know, recommended it to my students and others, but also to their significant others, their women, because I found it very funny and mm -hmm. insightful. Thank you. So, Definitely, guys, check out her documentary and show. How can they find more about you? Um, you know, just go to machalikeme.com, mm -hmm. and it'll tell you we're going to be in Hollywood for two more weeks doing the show, and then we'll be in July. All of July, we'll be at the Santa Monica Playhouse in Santa Monica. And then all of August, we're going to be at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Ooh, so, nice. I've been to Scotland. Come and say hi. All the show and her website information will be in the YouTube description mm -hmm. box. All right, guys? Check it out, and thank you so much, Hallie. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey there, thanks for watching our video. I hope you liked it. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel and watch all our other videos. Great news, too. Every Monday, we'll be putting out a new weekly video. That's right, we've got educational seminars, street interviews, uh, fun infield pickup videos, and anything else we can come up with that's fun for you guys to watch. So check back for that every Monday. Oh, and if that's not enough for you, remember that for the last 10 years, the ABCs of Attraction have been the finishing school for Asian gentlemen. So we've been teaching guys how to be better boyfriends, more confident, and better husbands. If you need that extra push, you can enroll in one of our classes. But until then, we'll see you every Monday. Bye!